Midnight Club, the first game, started out as a mixed bag. It was fun, but it had drawbacks and was certainly not a game for everyone. You start the game as a taxi driver that gets fed up by a racer and starts racing too. And here's the hardest part of the game, getting your first car. In this game, if you want to get into a race, you have to tailgate a racer to the start line, which is the hardest part of the game. Because the AI is stupid and because the racer's car is way faster than your taxi. You can't keep up with the car, which means that you'll have to memorize the path the AI racer takes and follow him to the start line. And that's pretty hard. It's harder than it sounds. Then you have to repeatedly try to win your first race with your slow taxi. In this game you don't have a racetrack like in other racing games. Here you have a big map and some checkpoints on the map. You have to make your way to the checkpoints and choose the shortest route while avoiding traffic and the police. And this type of racing is not for everyone. Some prefer to be told exactly where to go instead of having the freedom to choose. I like both systems. I like Midnight Club's way of letting you choose your way to the finish line. Ok, so after you win a race, the tailgated character challenges you to a one on one race. And after you beat the racer, you win their car. This is the only way to collect cars in the game. This is the procedure. And after you have the cars, you can tune them yourself. You don't get the option of tuning your vehicle. You get some presets and can choose the color, but that's it. You don't get the wealth of customization options you see in future Midnight Club games. But at least the maps are big. You get two locations, New York and London. And each has landmarks. And considering the time the game was released, the locations are good looking too. Smuggler's Run is a game where you play as a smuggler, who smuggles stuff into the country. So you pick up a package and go for it, but the police are up on your tail. And while on the way, the police chases you and it feels like you are playing GTA, they are more annoying than ever. They are faster, stronger and plentier than you. You have some regenerative health, but one charge of the police and that health goes down really fast. Also the way the car handles is weird. The cars are very lightweight, like they're made out of cardboard. And at the tiniest bump, which you can't see anyway, the car goes spinning. And the more damage you take, the more money you lose. And the gameplay is pretty frustrating. Cops are annoying, and it will take you many tries to finish most of the jobs in this game. Content-wise, well, Rockstar was experimenting with the open areas at the time, so it's a plus that they managed to succeed on first try, but it's still a bummer that you get only three locations and a handful of cars, but at least those three maps are detailed, like Rockstar games usually are. They are filled with NPCs, animals that you can run over, small towns, oil extraction plants and plenty of other little details that, when added up, make up for a great world. Rockstar was great at open world designing even back then, and the vehicles, you get six vehicle types. Oh, and as for gameplay, you do three things. One, you collect packages and deliver them to a location. Two, you play capture the flag with a package in teams. And three, you race. Overall, the game is great. It has some wonky physics and frustratingly difficult gameplay that will turn down many players. But still, the game is great. Surfing H3O is a tying game for a show about surfing and snowboarding, but you don't get snowboarding here, only surfing. And like tying games usually are, this one too is terrible. It's very repetitive. You have two options. Versus battles, where you compete for the biggest score, and tournament, where you compete for a set score. You have to collect buoys and do tricks in the meantime. And this is all you do. The controls are hard to pick up and master, especially since the game was designed to be played with a special surf plastic thingy put on the joysticks. And what is worse is that after you complete the say normal tournament, you get to the masters and you can't return to normal afterwards. 
every time you play a tournament, it will be at a master level. But at least the good part about the game is that you get 13 playable characters and each one has a multitude of surfboards. I get it that they tried to make it an arcade game, where you have to compete for the high score. But still, that is no excuse to make a PlayStation 2 game that lacks content. The game feels a little more than a mini game. Oni is an interesting title. It's good, but still has enough flaws to draw it back. The game consists of 14 very long missions. And by long, I mean a mission can take you around 40 minutes to finish. And in those missions you fight your way through each enemy. And by each enemy, I really mean each enemy. You have to beat up everyone. You can pick up weapons, for which ammo is pretty limited, or you can beat them up with your fists. The melee attacks are great, you get plenty of moves, but even so, it's annoying that the fighting system works against you. While you attack one enemy, another one comes from the back and attacks you, and there are also moments where the game is just annoying, and in some points even frustrating because of the checkpoint system. As I said, missions are long, so if you die, which isn't that hard, you get restarted from a significant portion back, which is pretty annoying. So, as I said, the game is good, but it has drawbacks. And now, a returning character, old me. It's Grand Theft Auto 3, which was released in October 2001. And you play in this one as Claude. Fun fact about Claude. The name Claude does not appear in Grand Theft Auto 3. Other characters call him by his nicknames, similarly to Claude Speed, the protagonist of Grand Theft Auto 2. So he has only nicknames. But how do we know that his name is Claude? Well, in San Andreas, he appears as a side character in a side mission. And there he is called Claude. Also, later, when Rockstar released the promotional release related to the previous game, the 10 year anniversary game of GTA 3, his name was confirmed that it is Claude. Also, another thing that you'll notice about Claude is that he never speaks. He's, he's a mute, which is interesting in phone calls. I mean, you, you just call the guy and he, he responds, but you never hear a word from him. That, that, that's some weird phone calls. I wonder if, why he has a phone. Anyway, Rockstar answered us why he does not speak. And Rockstar said, it may now seem obvious that people should all talk in games, but, with what, but this was not necessarily the case in 2001. Certainly, not in an open world game. We were making up a lot of procedures as we went along, and we decided that the NPCs, non-playable characters, should talk, and we would have to figure out how to make them talk, using motion capture cutscenes, sometimes they had never really been done before, at least not on the scale we were doing it. So we decided that the game's protagonist will not talk, partly to aid people identifying with him, but mostly because we had so many other problems to solve and this did not seem like a major issue. We started to discuss introducing a talking lead character when working on Vice City, but it was a lot of work. While the structure of GTA 3 may seem obvious or natural now, and the use of cutscenes made in the game's engine that look and feel like the game may seem simple and easy, it was really not the case back in 2001, when we had to figure out all of these things for the first time. Oh, and in San Andreas, CJ calls Claude a mute because he does not talk and CJ finds this unnerving. Another thing you'll notice pretty fast in GTA 3 is that you can swim. If you go into water, you're going to drown. But, according to the game files, to a Liberty City 3 article, not having the ability to swim in GTA 3 was because an oil spill in the Liberty City Harbor causing the water to be polluted, not Claude's inability. Also according to a graffiti in GTA 4, Claude seems to be dead. He appears in a graffiti which says rest in peace. So during the events of GTA 4 he might already be dead. 
Burglar's Run 2 is a huge improvement over the first one. The gameplay has been tweaked so that now it's more fun and less frustrating and not only this. You get more mission objectives, I mean if in the first one you had 3 mission objectives, race, um, deliver the package and capture the flag, now you get those plus others like following and chasing people or escaping the police. Also, now packages aren't just there on the map, you have to follow a helicopter around to drop the package, or you see packages drop via parachute. And not only this, the environments have hazards like landmines and falling rocks. And one of the best improvements in my opinion is that you finally aren't helpless against the police anymore. Here if you ram your vehicle into the police, they can explode. And having the option to fight back is a big improvement in my opinion. Also, if in the first one you had 6 vehicle types, in this one you get 8. And the graphics have been super improved. And this is not all of it. The controls have been also improved. The car doesn't feel like it's made out of cardboard anymore, it feels heavier and better. And the map design is better too, you get less unpredictable bumps. And a better map design overall. If the first Smuggler's Run game was great, this one is amazing. So Max Payne is an undercover cop that after some thugs murder his family, he seeks revenge by himself. While going after the killers, you will be shooting your way through waves of enemies having the ability to slow down time. This bullet time effect is especially useful when playing the PS2 version of the first game since the controls feel slippery and are not comfy at all. The best version of the game still remains the PC, but if you get used to the controls on PS2, the game is solid. I mean, it's the same game after all. The story is presented in comic book panels, in Rust you get to use different weapons like pistols, shotguns, molotovs. As differences, Max Payne 2 has a different story, the shooting mechanics feel more spot on, and it manages to get you into some dark police novel-like atmosphere. The games are great, I recommend you play them, both. They were some of the most anticipated games in the 2000s, and not for nothing. The games are some of the best undercover cop games I've played. From atmosphere to gameplay, the games manage to engage you and keep you wanting more. And the bullet time effect. Even if you can use it limitless, you can use it whenever you want. It never feels cheap, it always feels badass. Just try out the games, you will see how badass they are. State of Emergency is an arcade game where you have to cause as much mayhem as possible. You can roam the map to get quests and quests are very repetitive. All you are asked to do in those quests is to cause mayhem. Ok, I can't lie, they are different at what they tell you to do. I mean, an escort mission is different from just causing mayhem, so you get different objectives like escorting someone, or assassinate someone on the map, or deliver stuff, I mean, bring stuff from there to there, but essentially, Everything you do, no matter what the task is, it kind of feels the same at one point in the game. Then how is the mayhem you will ask? Well, there are times when the game feels good and times when the game feels like a broken clumsy mess, especially when shooting guns. The camera is always lacking, making it hard for you to target. Other than this, you get 5 characters to choose from and a map with multiple sections. The map feels very homogeneous and being accompanied by a repetitive gameplay makes up for a bad combination. Ok, I know that I've just said in the review that you get multiple tasks like escort missions or assassinations or causing mayhem for the score or bringing stuff from one place to the other, so the gameplay is varied. And I know that it sounds contradicting, but even if you get so many varied mission objectives, at one point the game felt repetitive. 
and along with the mixed gameplay that sometimes feels good and other times feels like a broken mess, the game is hard to judge. I mean, you have fun in it. And the game is good, but it's also bad. So the game is a mixed bag. You can have a lot of fun with it and it's a good game, but it has flaws too. It has many moments where it feels clumsy. The Italian Job is a great game, especially due to the nice car physics and controls. Or at least, in my case, that's what attracted me the most in the game. As game modes, you get a story mode that retells the main plot moments and consists on checkpoint races with a time limit, escaping the police and occasional races. And another mode is the stunt mode, where you drive in crash courses and have to finish the course in the time given. But even so, the stunt mode is creative. Overall, the game is short and sweet. The only downside is that it's forgettable. Even if it's original and fun, and has some really good driving controls, it still feels kind of generic. But considering that it's a tie-in game to a movie, it's in the good zone of the tie-in games, which is great. GTA Vice City was released in October 2002 and Rockstar began working on GTA Vice City only one month after the release of GTA 3 and if Claude was the first GTA protagonist that was present in a 3D game Tommy Versetti is the first character that is a speaking protagonist as Claude was a mute and the game was so beloved that you can see Tommy even in other games, like in Driver 3, there is a character named Timmy Vermicelli, which resembles pretty much Tommy, but well, more orange. And in Ocean City Racing, which is an open world racing title by the indie Turkish developer Onur Uka, we can see Tommy laying in an ambulance. And it's nice that this game too, like every GTA game, has easter eggs, like this one. And it has man much more content than that. And even fun content, because of the GTA logic. Like, everyone's dead, but she can't stop dancing after you, you kill everyone in the club. Or the annoying mission in GTA Vice City. I, I just wanted to, you to remember that. Or the fact that he can drive a motorcycle, a car, a tank, a helicopter, a boat, and can take out the whole army, but Tommy still can't swim. Or the GTA logic that when you flip a car upside down, it self-destructs. Or the cheat where you can drive on water in GTA Vice City. I know the picture is from San Andreas. But the cheat was a Vice City cheat. I mean, it shows Miami in its most iconic era. When, when there were so much flashy lights and the drug business and everything. It, it's, it's the most badass era. Okay, I'm not from Miami to know the whole history. But from what I know outside America, that is the most remarkable period and the most epic one for Miami, for an action game that is. Midnight Club 2 is a big improvement over its predecessor. The gameplay system is the same as in the first one, meaning that you have to tailgate the racer and then race with the checkpoints and then you win the cars by pink slip. But there are new stylistic differences that make this one a better type. For example, this game has more pedestrians on the side of the road and the damage models on the vehicles are better than in the first game. Also the game introduces the option to drive on two wheels. And it's also the first game that introduces bikes. And the controls are grippier. 
In the first one, the controls were wonkier. Your car was flying all over the map more often. But here the cars feel and control way nicer. And now you have three big maps to roam in. LA, Paris and Tokyo. And cop cars look way better in this game than in the previous one. And all of the cars look better. But a bummer is that with all of these improvements, you still couldn't tune your car. It, it's the same system as in the previous one. You can choose only the color and choose from some presets, but that's it. But at least a nice feature returning from the first game is the capture the flag game mode, which is fun. And also, this game introduced the slip slip slipstream feature which means that if you drive behind an opponent close enough this bar fills up and when it fills up you can nitrous boost yourself and another noticeable difference is the track layout the checkpoints are way better put so that you can see them from a distance which means that you depend less on looking on your minimap where the checkpoints are which means that the races are more fun Midnight Club 2 is a big improvement over the first game. Red Dead Revolver. This game is interesting because it's a mix of two. At first the game was developed by Capcom. Then Capcom sold the project to Rockstar. Rockstar kept the art styles and visuals and made the gameplay. And the game is okay. I mean for western games of that time, the game was okay. You get to play with multiple characters, Red has the dead eye ability, Annie can fire explosive bullets, Shadow can shoot fire arrows, overall the controls are clunky and hinder part of the fun and it's a bummer that the game is linear, you don't get free roam. The game is an arcade western title, it's okay but other games, especially other rockstar games overshadow it. Manhunt and its sequel Manhunt 2 are one of the most gory video games out there. These games are peak examples of gore in video games. After playing these games you feel like a maniac and that is good or bad depending on how you look at it. If you're one of those people who say video games are violent and point at this game which was intentionally made like this then you have something to protest against. But if you look at it from Rockstar's perspective, it's a mission complete. Because it really makes you feel like a crazy gory dude that kills victims in unimaginable ways. So what are these games that got banned in so many countries? They are stealth games. In each game you play as another protagonist. But the core gameplay is the same. As the name suggests, you hunt men and sneak behind gang victims or pursuers in the second game and kill them. And the reason for which the games got banned is because the kills are very gory. In fact, each weapon has three attacks depending on your button press. One press is a short kill and the longer you press the button, the gorier the kill. In the first game you play as James Cash, a guy that goes after gang members and kills them for snuff movies and the reason why he does this is because a guy saved him because he was condemned to death but instead he was put to sleep and woke up and the guy told him to kill gang members for snuff movies and after that he receives his freedom so in short you play as an ex-con that kills gang members for snuff movies, so that he can gain his freedom. In the second one you play as Danny, a mental patient that gets out, you can't remember his past because of amnesia and while he roams the city free, he has to kill his pursuers that want to get him back at the mental institution. As I said, the games are gory, that's their selling point and the reason they've got so popular but how are they gameplay wise? Gameplay wise they are solid. The stealth element feels just right. Enemy AI is ok, 
controls are smooth and the gameplay really makes you feel as if you're in the boots of a maniac, which is mission accomplished for the developers. Now, because of the bad reputation the games have and because they are banned in some countries, I can't recommend them to you. But I still can't deny that they are solid games and are far away from being bad games gameplay wise. And GTA San Andreas is in my opinion, still today, the most badass GTA ever released. E even, even GTA 5 couldn't surpass the game, in my opinion. What I liked most about GTA San Andreas was the map. It has many different biomes and different cities. In GTA 5 you had a big city, but when you went outside the city it was pretty repetitive. The, the environment was pretty repetitive, but not in San Andreas. In San Andreas you had deserts, you had forest, you had um, a, an area in San Fierro where it was uh, always foggy. So you, you had much more variety in the game and that was awesome. Also San Andreas was the first game that introduced bicycles. It was the first game where, where you could add tattoos, where you could go to the gym, where you could go to the barber and change your haircut. Even dressing up the main character was way more denser than in the previous games. Okay, these were just a few details. I don't want to insist on GTA San Andreas as you, you already know the game. So let's watch some memes. So GTA San Andreas is the type of game that where you can blow up a gas station using a bunch of flowers. GT San Andreas is the game where any vehicle can be destroyed except the bicycle. GTA is the game where you can walk along a police officer and even if you are armed, he, does, he doesn't do anything. GTA San Andreas is the game where you can fly a million dollar jetpack, but the main character still can climb a ladder. GTA San Andreas is the game where when you want to take a driver's license, you have to barrel roll a sports car. GTA San Andreas is the game where you can go from skin and bones to ripped in 3 days. And in multiplayer, GTA San Andreas is the game where you can fly a big plane, but the second player can't enter. And let's not forget in the GTA games the bundles of cash, where even though it's a big bundle of cash, you still get like $16, $15, $4. And GTA San Andreas is the type of game where you can go bald to the barber and return with more hair. Also, you can beat up a car using your bare hands and explode it. Club 3 was the first time the series got to such a level that it was a worthy rival for Need for Speed. There are debates if this game is better than Need for Speed Underground 2, but my opinion is that it's too debatable. Both have strong points and weak points. For example, Midnight Club doesn't have the variety of race types Need for Speed has. It doesn't have drag races or drift races or street acts. It has only circuit and point-to-point -point races. But on the other hand, Need for Speed doesn't have the immense customization options Midnight Club has. Compared to what Midnight Club offers in the customization department, Need for Speed is weak. Then, if you want to take it more into debate, Need for Speed Underground 2 is more accessible. I mean, the gameplay is more suitable for a larger audience, since you have difficulty settings and can put it on easy if the game is too hard. While Midnight Club, on the other hand, is a game for the pro players. It's tough. Even the easy races can be tough. You need patience and quick reflexes in the game. Midnight Club 3 is way more challenging than Need for Speed. Another comparison between the two is that Need for Speed in the car list has only cars and foreign force and SUVs, while Midnight Club has cars, SUVs, foreign force and bikes. 
but let's return to reviewing only Midnight Club. This game is the first one that introduces something that would have been a big selling point from the beginning, customization. And the customization options are plenty. And plenty is even too less to say. It even surpasses the wealth of option need for speed Underground 2 has. You can tune your vehicle in many different ways and it's one of the best tuning menus I have ever seen in games. And another big improvement is that now you earn cash with which you can buy cars, performance parts and customization parts. And this is a big improvement over the pink slip system from the previous game. And the customization system is one of the best I have seen in racing game history. And Midnight Club 3 introduces the abilities. Vehicles are split into categories. Big bulky vehicles have aggro, which lets you bulldozer through traffic. And lighter and faster vehicles have zone, which slows down time. Also, if you are searching for the game, get the remix version and not the standard version. The standard version has three maps, Detroit, Atlanta and San Diego, while the remix version has four, Detroit, Atlanta, San Diego and Tokyo. The remix version also has 24 more vehicles, 25 more songs and more races. So remember, if you're game hunting for this game, Get the remix version. It has more content. I consider Midnight Club 3 a masterpiece. Its tuning system is one of the best in video games and even if the game's difficulty is not for everyone, I still consider it a masterpiece. It's amazing. If you haven't played it yet, just try it out. The Warriors is the tie-in game of the movie The Warriors, released in 1979. It depicts one of the many gangs that New York had in the 70s. The gang's name is The Warriors. It's nice that it retells the story and adds some extra backstories too. So if you liked the movie, I recommend you try the game. If you like the story in the movie, here it is way more clear. The game explains the rivalries between the gangs and the way they escape the police and many more. The game is split into around 20 missions. During those you will play with different characters like the 9 primary guys, Swan, Ajax, Cleon, Vermin, Cochessi, Cowboy, Snow, Fox and Rembrandt. The Warriors is a brawler. You mostly just brawl on the street. You get a light attack button, a heavy attack button and a grab button. You also get a nice variety of weapons like your paint spray or a shiv or a bat. You can also stealth take down enemies. The fighting gets to be very repetitive, but even if it feels at some point repetitive, fighting is not the only thing you'll do. Rockstar added many tasks to spice things up. So you'll be doing stuff like collecting protection money from Coney Island businesses, or stealing car stereos, and breaking into and looting shops, or get into chasings, running after someone, or from a mob or gang members. Ok, so The Warriors, as a whole, is one of those few games that are better than the movie. You know that they say that the book is better than the movie, and the movie is better than the game. Well, in this case, the game is better than the movie, as it has the same story, but is more detailed. The game stretches out a 2 hour long movie into a well written, entertaining, 12 hour gameplay. GTA Liberty City Stories and GTA Vice City Stories, I'm going to use snippets of the review I've made for the PSP games, as the PSP and the PS2 games are the same games, only with slight graphical differences. So I'm going to add the snippets from the PSP review and add some extra commentary to the mix. Liberty City Stories takes place 3 years earlier than GTA 3. It is set in the GTA 3 map of Liberty City and the main character is Tony Cipriani, who you can see in GTA 3 too, only there he gained some weight. 
Vice City Stories takes place two years before Vice City and is set in the Vice City map. The main character is Victor Vance, who you can see two years later in Vice City in the first cutscene. He also gained weight and he dies in that first cutscene of the game. And after so much badassery in Vice City Stories, he dies way too lame. I mean the guy is a legend and dies so unlegendary. Well, at least, you see kids, Rockstar teaches us a lesson. Don't do crimes or you'll die unfancy. Just like Johnny Klebitz, the protagonist of GTA The Lost and Damned, the way he died in GTA 5 still makes me sad, the poor guy. Also, in Vice City Stories, you can ride a bike and do bunny hops. The bike is in a specific location, only in one place in the whole map you can find it. It's somewhat of an easter egg. Also Vic from Vice City Stories can swim, but Tony from Liberty City Stories can't swim. Also for some reason there is a bubblehead cheat code. And as a compromise for not knowing how to swim, in Liberty City Stories there is a car some water mode, like in Vice City. And in Vice City Stories, you can fly with your car, so you don't need a helicopter or a plane. Also, fun fact about Victor Vance. He's the only protagonist of the 3D universe who hasn't visited Liberty City. And if you steal a military vehicle, they will call the police. And just like the other GTA games, they are must play, the two games. Liberty City Stories and Vice City Stories, they are prequels to each game. GTA Liberty City Stories is, pre is the prequel to GTA 3 and GTA Vice City Stories is the prequel to Vice City. And they are masterpieces and are as awesome as any GTA game with marvelous gameplay, free room, attention to details, the, the amazing 10 out of 10 games we usually get from Rockstar. Or is Bully. And if you've never played the game, you should. Just imagine that this game is GTA, but school edition. You play as a student. And the way the game plays is like GTA, but instead of driving cars, you drive a bike. And instead of guns, you shoot with your slingshot and other weapons more adjusted to a student. You also beat up people, rob them, you have a big map to explore and a lot of stuff to do. You know how much detail Rockstar puts into their games. This one is no exception. It's another masterpiece. If you've never played the game, you definitely should. Okay, so this was the video. If you liked it, please hit the like button and subscribe. If you want to financially support me in my pursuit to review as many video games as possible, you can do that on Patreon or on the channel's membership section. You will help me a lot. If you want, you can follow me on Twitch, Instagram or Discord. And if you want to see another video of mine, just wait till I stop talking and terribly thumbnails of other videos I've made. Thanks for watching.